الشيطان بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is uh, my pleasure uh, to be here with you today. Uh, my presentation will be in English, consistent with the subject matter and my colleagues. However, I have to thank the Center for Commercial Arbitration in uh, the kingdom for translating the slides and uh, uh, making a good job of uh, translation. Uh, if we can go to the uh, first, oh, I go, okay. So as my uh, colleague Tim Martin said, I will be talking about another landmark case in the international oil and gas arbitration. But this case is particularly important for us here because it was one that was brought against the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia by Aramco in 1954. The uh, case is commonly known as the Onassis uh, arbitration and uh, if you bear with me, you'll know why it was called uh, that. Now, before I go into the case itself and discuss the rational, rationale of the uh, tribunal as well as how it decided what law to apply, I think it's important to share with you the background of uh, the case. And my presentation will be fairly short, but I have written a commentary on this case because, again, it's important, but it's close to me being a Saudi, uh, first of all, and secondly, having uh, worked for Saudi Aramco all of my, or most of my professional life. So the background goes back to May 1933. As you know, the kingdom uh, signed the famous concession agreement with the Standard Oil of California, SoCal. That concession agreement granted SoCal exclusive rights to explore, exploit, and, and here's the important part of this, part of the uh, concession it granted it the right to explore, exploit, tra and transport oil within the concession area and the kingdom. SoCal, which is Chevron today, formed a subsidiary and named it California Arabian Standard Oil Company, CASAC, and that company was to operate the concession until two other major shareholders joined in, and those two are Exxon and Mobil, or today, one company. That company, Kasek, was renamed to the Arabian American Oil Company, or as we all know, Aramco, which in 1989 became Saudi Aramco. Not by means of expropriation, as we've seen in other cases, but by means of negotiations and basically the kingdom bought all the rights those companies had in the concession in Saudi Arabia. Now, it's known that Aramco discovered some of the largest oil fields in the world, onshore and offshore, and its first commercial oil well is appropriately called Damam number no. seven, uh, this was uh, in 1938, uh, late King Abdullah uh, renamed it as the Prosperity Well. And I'm sorry I didn't uh, put the slide on, but if you allow me, I will go to the next slide. Again, I believe my presentation and the presentations of my colleagues will be on the website of the Saudi Arbitration Center. 
Now, brief look at the background of the dispute. The uh, dispute arose in January of 1954 when the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and at the time it was late King Saud, signed a shipping contract with the Greek shipping tycoon Aristotle Onassis, who had a company called Satco. And Aramco argued that that agreement was contrary to the exclusive, to the concession that was granted to it because it gave Satco an exclusive right to transport Saudi oil out of Saudi ports. As a result, Aramco objected and refused to comply with the Onassis contract, arguing that it violated the letter and spirit of the concession agreement and it conflicts with long-standing business arrangements and practices. In response, the Kingdom argued that Aramco was not entitled to absolute right to transport oil beyond outside Saudi territorial waters since such right was not expressly provided in the concession agreement signed in May of 1933. Kingdom further argued that even if such right existed, if it were conferred upon Aramco, then the company would have been equally in breach of the concession agreement by transference that right to a third party, i.e. the buyers that purchase Saudi oil produced by Aramco. The center here, because it translated the uh, presentation, have added more slides, so if I don't keep up with them, please accept my apologies. Now let's talk about the arbitration uh, itself and what really happened when some of the uh, issues came up, first impression issues, and uh, we will deal with that as each one comes up. And to resolve the dispute, both the Kingdom and Aramco agreed to refer their dispute to an ad hoc arbitration in Switzerland in accordance with the arbitration clause in the concession agreement. Now, at that time of the arbitration, it was before the New York Convention of 1958, obviously. And as just a matter of note, the concession agreement contained no express choice of law clause. And this is another testament uh, which shows that despite the sophistication of these American oil companies, these old concession agreements did not necessarily cover each and every aspect of a dispute and how it would be resolved. But as the disputes came up, went to arbitration, the law developed, and we have seen uh, a great examples from uh, Tim Martin's presentation uh, in the Middle East and how the issues were resolved to the satisfaction of the parties and how the law in oil and gas arbitration case precedent have evolved over the years. Now, the kingdom clearly argued that its law would apply Sharia. And the tribunal did, in fact, agree that the law of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia governed the concession agreement, but it was not prepared to fully accept or apply all Sharia principles. Well, it's, and I have to qualify this, it said, it determined that Islamic law was in its embryonic state. 
And I believe the tribunal at that time meant that Sharia was in its embryonic state vis-a-vis -vis oil and gas, not the principles of law which have existed for over 14 centuries. And there was plenty of case precedent and principles in Sharia that talk about parties' interpretation of contracts, fairness, equity, etc. And we'll now go to uh, the next slide, which I think we've talked about that. And the last part I will address now. So in addition to agreeing to applying the Saudi law, the tribunal decided the following would be applied with respect to the choice of law. One, law of the kingdom applied to the relationship between the parties. Two, any gaps in law of the kingdom was filled by principles from worldwide custom and practice in the oil business. Third, that general principles of law applied because the concession agreement had an international character. Four, sale and transport of oil is governed by custom and practice of maritime law and international oil business, and all of that will be factored as part of the law that the tribunal would apply to the dispute. And finally, the tribunal decided that public international law applied when certain matters cannot be governed by municipal law of the state, state being the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Now, without getting into too much details, the tribunal upheld the concession agreement and rejected the Onassis contract. Now, my uh, purpose for sharing this case with you is to talk about the landmark case, but you know, what are the lessons learned? What are the takeaways from this significant landmark case? Okay. Uh, okay, so we will start with that one. Uh, the key lesson learned by this arbitration is represented by the kingdom's subsequent response to the decision of the tribunal, which the kingdom honored and respected the decision of the tribunal, and it honored it in accordance with the teachings of the Sharia premised on the Holy Quran and Sunnah, which urge and command every Muslim to respect their pledges and agreements. Two, from that stems another key lesson learned, which is that Islamic law principles do apply to the interpretation of contract terms and conditions, including parties' intentions. Now, if you go back just a few years before that decision, I wanted to cite a case that was somewhat strange, but that case was in was, the decision was contrary to what the tribunal here concluded, and the case relates to a dispute between the uh, Abu Dhabi uh, Petroleum Development and the concession that was granted to it. The dispute arose, and a sole arbitrator was named, his name was Lord Asquith, and I'm trying to find the, uh, what he said, uh, there it is. Now, when the 
company called Petroleum Development brought the case against Abu Dhabi, the sole arbitrator decided not to use Islamic law, and he based that decision on something rather awkward, and I will read what he said to you and give you my uh, take on that, but he said, and this is in the early 50s, he said, if any municipal system of law were applicable, it would prima facie be that of Abu Dhabi, where the concession was granted. But no such law can be reasonably said to exist. The Sheikh administers a purely discretionary justice. This is Lord Asquith saying with the assistant of the Quran. And it would be fanciful to suggest that in this very primitive region, there is any settled body of legal principles applicable to the construction of modern commercial instruments. Now, Lord Asquith obviously was either a lazy arbitrator but other than that, I don't think he would be uh, that ignorant because the principles of Islamic law were well developed to apply and interpret contracts. And what the other tribunals have done as cited by Tim and the tribunal in the Onassis case, yes, you would apply the law of the land, but you would supplement it with custom international practices in the field itself, here being oil and gas. Anyway, it's part of history uh, today, but uh, the uh, case uh, that I'm presenting today presented also other one or two uh, takeaways that uh, I would like uh, to share with you, uh, having spent most of my professional life in the oil and gas business, and today as a private practitioner, I do a lot of that work. The kingdom in the late 50s, this was in 1958 when this case was decided, unlike other oil producing countries at that time, the kingdom essentially took a long-term view in ensuring that its national economic interests were met while honoring its contractual obligations and reassuring foreign investors. In short, if it is your best interest to accept a ruling that is not to your liking, then it is wise and courageous as well to do that. And finally, a major principle of the kingdom's domestic and international policy can be summed up as follows. While we believe that it was, while we believe that what unites the people of the world ultimately is greater than what divides us. This is, ladies and gentlemen, is very much consistent with the Sharia, which Prince Bender has eloquently described in the previous session that it's a system that can be used anytime for whatever matter, but clearly needs an understanding of it. And today there's plenty of experts and Muslims and non-Muslims that know Sharia extremely well. Before I close, I want to thank the Saudi Commercial Arbitration Center for inviting me to come to speak to uh, you, uh, to be with this distinguished panel. And I want to congratulate them on their successes, despite their short uh, period since they launched it a couple of year, years ago. Uh, and. Uh, I brought with me copies of the 
uh, note itself that I, I mentioned to you, and if you'd like a copy of it, I'm happy to give it to you. Thank you for your attention, and enjoy the rest of the conference.